Amen. All right. Let's get into the word. Let's get into the word. I'll, I'll start here. Since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, uh, life has changed, <laughs> has it not? Uh, with the explosion of products and the ability to buy those products. Um, if you want it, you go out and buy it. Uh, and in fact, you don't even have to go out and buy it anymore. All you have to do is pull out your phone, push a few buttons, and that product will arrive on your doorstep, right? This is called consumerism, okay? Now, I know a lot of times when we hear that word, we're just kind of like trained in the church to think it's all bad. It's actually not all bad. Like on some level, um, you're, you're always going to have a consumer relationship with the grocery store or Devonshire Mall because in those settings, your needs are what matters most. You with me? Okay. The danger comes in, however, when we start to relate to God in the church like we do uh, the grocery store. The, the, the danger comes in when we start to pick and choose our spiritual experiences, kind of like we do picking out a pair of jeans, right? Uh, this is called consumer Christianity, and this is bad. Um, I, I read this quote actually last uh, January, and I thought I'd just read it again for you. Sky Jathani uh, wrote it this way. He says, when we approach Christianity as consumers, rather than seeing it as a comprehensive way of life and an, an interpretive set of beliefs and values, Christianity becomes just one more brand we consume along with Gap and Apple and Starbucks to express identity. Hear this. The demotion of Jesus Christ from Lord to label means to live as a Christian no longer carries an expectation of obedience and good works, but rather the perpetual consumption of Christian merchandise and experiences. Okay, let me just explain maybe a little bit easier what he's saying there. When we demote Jesus from Lord to label, we end up in the church saying really silly things. Like the church exists to give me a pleasant experience. I want to worship with the songs that I want to worship to for as long as I want to worship. I want a comfy chair. I want a funny sermon. And I want my kids taught by a Sunday school teacher dressed up like Peppa Pig. And if I don't get those things, I'm out. And I'll go find some other church that will give me those things. Okay? This this is consumer Christianity. This is demoting Jesus from Lord to label. This, that attitude, that is the perpetual consumption of Christian experiences. And to be very clear, it is not the way of Jesus. So the question is this, is there a better way? Is there a practice from the life of Jesus that has the ability to change us, not just from being constant takers, but actually constant givers? And the answer is absolutely yes. The fix for consumerism infiltrating the church is following Jesus in a lifestyle of generosity. So we're in this series, DNA. Week one, we talked about how Jesus is our hope. Week two, how the church is our home. Week three, faith is our lifestyle. And today, we're gonna, here's our fourth kind of value statement is this, that generosity is our joy. Oh, come on, just say that out loud. Say, generosity is our joy. That was weak. Come on, one more time. Say, generosity is our joy. <laughs> that's better, that's better. There's uh, several different ways in the scriptures that actually show us how to express generosity with joy. Now, the framework of this message, if you've been around Parkwood for at least a year, you've probably heard it before. Uh, the framework is something that I, I, I taught about a year ago, but I'm going to kind of fill it in a, a little bit different uh, this morning. But why don't we turn in our Bibles to John chapter 9, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out three different ways that we can, with joy in our hearts, express generosity. Okay, so if you're taking notes, I have 
three different ways that, that we're going to be able to do this. Point number one, here it is, that we can be generous with our time, with our time. Now, I know, I get it right now, there is somebody sitting here or watching online that's saying, Pastor, back off, okay? I don't have time. You don't know my life, okay? With all due respect, friend, you don't know my life, okay? Like some of you honestly think, all I do is preach a sermon one day a week, and that's my job. Uh, it is not my job. Uh, as the lead pastor of this church, there is a significant amount of demands on me all week long. And on top of trying to run this church and pastor the people, I'm also trying to be a good husband to my wife and dad to my kids. And listen, it can be really easy for me to say, man, I don't have time. Really, really easy. But here's the thing that I've learned, okay? And it is true of all of us. We all make time for what we think is important. All of us. Every single one of you will carve out room in your schedule for what you think is important. But I just want to... I just want to listen to the words of Jesus this morning, okay? So just in case you think Danny Gray's coming after you, I'm not. Jesus is. Okay, so you're going to have to take it up with him, okay? John 9, verse 4. This is what Jesus says. He says, as long as it is day, we must, come on, just say the word must. That's the last time I'm going to get you to repeat something. All right, notice, he doesn't say uh, you should, if you get around to it. No, no, no. We must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. I love how practical Jesus is. What he's pointing out is a very obvious truth. He's saying there's only so much time we're allotted in a day, 24 hours. Comes, it goes. There's only so much time we're allotted, allotted in a week, there's only so much time we're allotted in a month or a year. There's only so much time that we're allotted in this life. And when it's gone, it's gone. So what Jesus says is this, use your time well. In fact, he says we must use our time well to do what? He says, well, to do the works of God. So we just asked that question, well, what are the works of God? What did Jesus come to do? Well, it's kind of a loaded question, but I'll, I'll give you a big one. Ready? He came to build his church. He just did. That's Matthew 16. Jesus died for the church. That's Ephesians 5. Jesus is coming back one day for the church. It's John 14. Simply put, the church is God's plan A, and there is no plan B. B. Period. The church is God's bride. The church is God's family. The church is God's body present on the earth. And so the logic is just, honestly, what better way than to spend our time, than to actually create space in it for the one thing that Jesus worked so hard to set up? Hear it again. Jesus says we must we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. There's only so much time. So what we do is, is this. We're generous with our time. That means that all of us, we need to honestly ask the question, beyond showing up in this room for an hour and a half on a Sunday morning, beyond this, have you created space to actually roll up your sleeves and help uh, build the church of Jesus Christ? Now, actually, we don't build it. Jesus said, I will build my church, but we come alongside him. It's the co-mission of Christ. Are you creating space? Because this is a way that all of us can be generous with our time. That's the first way. Here's the second way is this, that we're generous with our talent, our talent, Psalm 139, one of my favorite psalms, hands down. 
The psalmist writes that when we were in our mother's womb, that God knit us together. What a beautiful image. Like, like seriously, someone needs to hear this. You are the way that you are on purpose. Okay, you look the way you look. You have the body type that you have, the eye color, the hair color, or lack thereof in my case. But like, we are the way that we are. Amen. Why? Because God made us this way. That when we were in our mother's womb, the imagery of the scriptures is that God was building us, making us, us. It's beautiful. Like you're not an accident, okay? Just let that just sit. We are the way that God wants us to be. It is amazing. Um, But that's just the scene, okay? He also made us in the unseen. Because how many people know we're more than just a body, okay? Your personality, your, 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 your gift mix. Like, 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 like some of you, you just, from the day you were born, you just excelled in certain things, right? You, you, you just were good. You had these talents, right? There's the seen, there's the unseen. And Psalm 139 says, yeah, credit goes to God. It doesn't go to you. Credit goes to God. He knit you together. And then in the New Testament, it takes it even a step further. It says not only... Did God create us and make us in the seen and in the unseen realms? But, but, but also he uniquely gives us spiritual gifts for the edification and building up of the church. I just want to read you one text, Romans 12, 6 to 8. He says this. This is Paul writing to the church in Rome. He says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. What's he saying? God has gifted all of us, built us all. We all have these unique things that make us us, and then the spiritual components, and he's saying, be generous with what God has gifted you with. So we're not just generous with our time, we're, we're, we're generous with our, our gifts. And, and can I just tell you, God wants all of us in the church to use our gifts for the building up of this church and for his glory. Like, in just bottom line, we have so many people here who are. Like, we have hundreds of people who call Parkwood home who right now are serving this church, and we probably don't say it enough, but seriously, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you from the, from the depths of our being, but I am convinced. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's honestly. Listen, I am convinced that as we move into our next 100 years, as we launch into this multi-site movement, we, we, we look at all these new ways that we can reach out. It's going to take all of us. Not just being generous with our time, but being generous with our talents, our very presence. Because that's it, right? Like, like being generous with your time is creating the space in your, in your calendar, but being generous with your talents is then filling that space with your gifts and your abilities And like, this is God's plan. So first, generous with our time. Second, generous with our talents. And then the third is this, generous with our treasure. I'm talking dollar, dollar bills, (laughs) y'all. I have no clue where that came from. (laughs) I don't know if that was the Holy Spirit. (laughs) I don't know. I'll be the first one to admit that. Um, (laughs) Okay. Focus. God (laughs) has gifted all of us, all of us in this room on some level financially, and he's calling all of us on some level to respond with generosity. All of us. And really, I've been pastoring long enough. I've taught, and usually when it comes to this topic, and we start talking about money in the church, it's just right now, like some of you are really uncomfortable. 
You just are. And like, or like you invited your friend and this is your friend if you're here and this is your first Sunday, you're like, well, I knew it. The church just wants my money. Uh, listen, no, no, like I, I honestly don't. And, and people are like, why do you have to talk about money every now and then? Honestly, because the Bible does. Because Jesus does repeatedly. And actually for us not to address this is what I call pastoral malpractice. It's not good for my spiritual health and it's not good for your spiritual health. So we have to actually deal with the things that the scripture deals with. And it deals with head on this conversation of money, right? And like, like one specific pushback that, that I often hear is specifically we get around the topic of tithing, right? 10%. And I've said this here before, but it, it happens, right? People come, they're like, seriously, Danny? Yeah. You're telling me that God owns 10% of my money? And my answer has always been the same. No, I'm not. I am not telling you that God owns 10% of your money. I'm telling you that God owns 100% of your money. Yeah. And not only that, 100% of everything else that you have, Amen. including the air that is coming through your lungs right now. Like, like he owns all of it. And, and what he does is he actually gifts it to us so that we can be stewards for his kingdom. I, I want you to listen to the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Just listen to this question that he asked the church in Corinth. Simple question, but he just says this. What do you have that you did not first receive? Parker, I just, I just want you to think about your life right now. Okay? I want you to ask that question over your life right now. What do you have that you did not first receive? Everything you have, God gave it to you. That brain you have, God gave it to you. The job you have, God gave it to you. The finances, the car, the house, what, God gave it to you. And again, not for it to terminate on ourselves. That is never God's plan. It was so that we could be stewards of what God has given us so that we can respond with radical generosity so that he may receive glory, honor, and praise. This is his plan. Listen, um, every parent on some level is going to be able to understand what I'm going to say next. Uh, so we, we have young kids, Nora and Bo, and uh, we went through a season when both of them were about two years old and they learned these two words that, when applied, sent shivers up my spine. Okay? And it was the words, it's mine. A any, any parents know what I'm talking about? Like, it just happens. Okay? Our kids are sinful. Okay? Just call it what it is. And, and, and we know that, right? They're, they're, they're selfish. And, and this is where they get around to this, these two words. It's mine. It's my car, it's my toy, it's my book, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. And, and so Natalie and I have kind of come out of this season where we're teaching our young kids how to share and be generous with one another. But what's amazing to me, what's amazing to me is that for, for almost all of us that are here today, we learned somewhere along the line that it's socially inappropriate to say those words, so we stop saying the words, it's mine, but our hearts are still there. Like, it is literally happening this morning as I speak. That's my money, pastor. That's, that's, that's my stuff, Danny, back off. That's, that's, it's my time. I'll fill it as I want. It's, it's mine. It's, it's, it's kind of funny, right? Like, like, honestly, there's not much that separates us from a two-year-old. Okay? I just slapped you all across the face right there. But, like, it's true. Like, like, at times, this is not the posture of our lives. It's like this. And we, and we have all this stuff that on some level we know that God gave us, but the posture is like we just hold on as tight as we possibly can. And if we could, we'd probably be saying, oh, it's mine. It's mine, right? There's this, this tight thing. But I think what God is constantly trying to bring his church into is to release the fist. <laughs> And understand, again, everything you have is his. Like, like, honestly, with as much love as I can just offer as the pastor of this church right now to that mindset, it's mine. 
I just need you to hear me. It's not yours. It's not, everything you have is his. And listen, the, the big idea is like, if you're not plugged in here, if you're not giving here of your time and your talents and, and your treasure, none of this is ever going to feel like home. None of it. You'll complain about the church. You'll long for the ideal church. I, I Probably, chances are, you'll be gone in less than a year. Why? Because the big idea is where you're generous feels like home. Like this, worship team, come on, come on back up. Help me land this plane. This is, this is the message. Listen, and, and again, it's just woven throughout the scriptures. We are stewards of God's grace that comes to us in many different areas. But I think the question is this, as, as we look to, to close today, how? Um, and there's, in a church of our size, there's so many different ways that, that, that I can apply this message. And it, but what I want to do is just in light of the, the, the decision we made last week in our board meeting, I, I do want to just talk to us in closing about this downtown site. If everything goes according to plan, uh, we will take ownership and possession of this property in March, uh, which is about a month away. So it's not far However, uh, we're not looking to start ministry in the downtown until uh, September. So around September of next year, we're going to be launching kind of a second location of Parkwood in the downtown. Now, the reason why there's this gap in between March and September is because we have a lot of stuff that we have to do in the meantime. Uh, there's a number of renovations that we have to do to the building. There's launch teams that we have to send, figure out our pastoral leadership. Like, like it's considerable. We have a lot of work in the next six months. And I, I told you earlier in the sermon that we, we voted to purchase the building 100%. It was amazing. But what I didn't tell you, and I told the members last week, was actually because of your financial generosity last year, uh, we actually don't have to take out a mortgage on this at all. We're going to buy this building in cash. Praise God. Like, praise God. Someone's thinking, I'm off the hook. <laughs> I'm not done talking yet. <laughs> That's just to purchase the building. The reality is the renovations to this building could cost us somewhere in the ballpark of two hundred to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and that's on top of our budget that we already have running for the year. And then after that, we're also looking at the ongoing ministry expenses in the downtown, which is significant. Uh, the reality is that there is a cost to the mission, right? Uh, for us to move forward into our next 100 years and reach out beyond this walls. It's going to take all of us on some level, right, of saying either I'm going to be generous with my time, I'm going to be generous with my talents, or definitely it's going to take all of us to say I need to be generous with my treasure. Releasing some funds to actually see the ministry in the downtown succeed. So, so, so here's, here's what we're going to do. And I'm giving you about a month's notice here so you can prepare. In the month of March, and we just thought this is a great month, it's the month that we're gonna be taking possession of this property. In the month of March, we are asking every single person that calls Parkwood home, if this is your church, we're asking you to give something above and beyond your regular giving to this church to the downtown. Now, I wanna be clear, this is above and beyond your regular giving, okay? If all you do is stop giving to this location and start giving to that one, it actually doesn't help things at all, okay? Uh, what we need is you to continue to give like you've been giving. But as we go into March, we are asking for sacrifice. It was David who said, I refuse to offer God a sacrifice that cost me nothing. He says, I want it to cost me. And so as we move forward, we are asking everyone, would you consider at some point in the month of March, over and above what you're already giving, 
to give towards this downtown site. It's going to take all of us together. I, I, like I said earlier, the vote was the easy part. Now starts the real work. We're preparing, we're getting ready. And together as a family, I just feel it in my bones that God is calling us to respond with generosity. Can we stand on up to our feet? I, I, I wanna read you one more passage. As we consider giving of our time and our talents and our treasure to the downtown project, 2 Corinthians 9, uh, just so you understand the context, in Jerusalem, there was a wave of persecution that came on the church and they were financially hurting. So Paul goes to the church in Corinth to, to take up an offering to help the church succeed in Jerusalem. Kind of in some ways very similar to what we're doing, calling upon our church here to give so that we can plant a church over there. I want you to hear these words. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7. Paul says, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Can I just tell you, just as we close, far too many Christians have been beat over the head with messages on giving. And it's compulsion, right? And it's this, this domineering thing. But listen to me. Paul, notice, Paul doesn't say to the church in Corinth, hey, yo, church, give because I said so. No. He doesn't say, hey, listen, there's a need over there. Eternity's long, hell's hot, give now. No, that's not what he does. He comes to them and he says, listen, church, I want you to talk to God. And I want you to give what God puts on your heart. Not reluctantly, not under compulsion. No one is pressuring you here, but just always keep in mind that the measure that you sow is the measure that you'll receive. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. He doesn't actually love it when we're, we're it's like, ah, I gotta do this, and the pastor seems angry. No, don't, don't. God loves a cheerful giver. God loves loves when we can be generous with a joy in our heart. God loves when we can see a need, feel a need, and then respond to that need with excitement in our hearts and a smile on our face. God loves it. So church, let's be generous for his glory.